Hi, I'm Andrew Wallace, and welcome to the We've Got a Problem podcast, where each week we explore inspiring stories of struggle, success, and solutions to prevalent problems, and how my guests have turned a problem into an opportunity. This week, I'm joined by Raj Goodman-Anand with 16 years of experience in B2B digital marketing. He's the founder of Goodman Lantern, an award-winning content marketing agency that helps businesses sell better and grow faster. He's a serial entrepreneur, an accomplished angel investor, and he also holds a master's degree in artificial intelligence focused on research in adaptive behavior and intelligent systems. Raj, welcome to the show. Thank you, Andrew. Good to be on, and thank you for the lovely introduction. You just made that. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So, I, I mean, that's a lot of a lot of stuff. But we've we talked a little bit offline. We messaged back and forth. I, I I know what you do in a sense, but I want to know a little bit how you got here. What what brought you into the digital marketing space? What got you to to where you are? Give us give us a little bit of background. As you mentioned, I'm, a, I'm an engineer by training. I was on a PhD to, to AI, so I was doing research in AI. Back in the day, my mom thought it was a study of UFOs, uh, but... <laughs> but it turned out not to be. You, you, were, did you, you hopefully didn't think that as, as you were getting into it. Yeah, so, so my mother thought that was that's what that it was, but obviously now we all know what AI is. It's, it's been the buzz in speaking marketing about AI and what AI is, but... Um, I think what fascinated me about computers was initially video games. I love video games. And back in the day as as a child, I think most kids, you know, get into it really early. And that's what I enjoyed doing. And I wanted to build video games. So did video game AI, uh, build smart, uh, artificial, obviously bots as they call them. Um, but then I met somebody in the UK from the U S who mentioned about MySpace. Okay. Uh, and, and for people who don't know what MySpace is, it's the old person's Facebook. <laughs> it was pre-Facebook Facebook, yeah. That's it. Pre-Facebook Facebook is probably a nice way to put it. But um, so, I, so I saw that and I'm like, wow, I can actually build that in a couple of weeks. So I actually built a clone of MySpace in three weeks. I worked <laughs> 19 hours uh, per day and I basically built a clone of it. Um, so I built it and I'm like, okay, I built it now. So I'm going to have customers who will want to build their own MySpace. Of course, if you happens. build it, they will come, right? They'll, <laughs> you're going to be the next big thing. Okay, great. Yeah, just built it. You don't have to do anything about it. Just build it. That's it. And that never happened, actually, as, as, as you rightly mentioned. So that, you know, so I've kind of built that thing. And like, I have this tool that looks pretty cool. Um, like, why aren't people buying this off me? And then I met somebody who said, well, you should market this thing. What's that? Like, what's marketing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So effectively, I met a few people. I got a scholarship to do a mini MBA from the University of Cranfield, which is in the Midlands, middle of the UK, as it were. And uh, I learned about marketing and selling. And I just loved marketing, actually. I just fell in love with marketing and what opportunity it has for um everybody in the world and i'm like wow okay this is is awesome i want to do more marketing so then the company i formed initially was social media uh, software company focused on marketing the the customers so a, a travel agency can buy it to uh share experiences of their end customers mm-hmm. with other customers to sell more of that uh, of their travel so that you know big travel companies are working with us the UK Parliament. Um, there were other video game uh, production companies working with us. So a lot of different companies. That was my first ever business. I was just 22, 23 um, when I started the business. It didn't go all the way to, the, to plan, but I learned a lot from it. I think I learned more from my failures than from my successes. So it was, I learned a lot from the experience and wrote a book for peace and education on social media marketing. In the evenings, I was running a, what we call in the UK, a hen party company, which is a, in the <laughs> US is called a bastard party company. Right. So I was like, yeah, okay, I, I can do marketing. I can get, I can, <laughs> I can get, do, I can. Uh, <laughs> I can do marketing and I can get, I don't know what hen parties are in the UK, but I mean, as far as what goes on there, but 
in the in the U.S., you're 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 booking strippers. I mean, you're 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 booking you're booking the 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 male uh, fake police officer or or fireman to come into their bachelorette party and and and, and do all that. Hopefully it was a little bit more savory than that, but maybe not. Maybe you were just putting together nice events. I don't know. So, I mean, th- obviously, even to, to, to have that kind of a business, you're, you're having to, to actively market. And I think that that's something, when you talk about social media marketing and any of these things, we have now, I mean, obviously now, we understand the importance of these things. But back then, especially years ago, when... When, when, when MySpace was a thing, or even when Facebook was first a thing, what, what many people, and I don't know how many of my listeners, particularly what age group they're falling into for this episode, but a lot of people forget that Facebook, even for the first several years, was just a thing they had on college campuses. It barely moved beyond a dating website. I mean, it was thinly veiled because you would you'd look and you'd, you'd find somebody who you had a, in a class and you'd look and see if they were single too, and you'd go through this whole thing. But it, it didn't have this 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 uh, cachet of being a place where people actually used it as as real social media to 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 post their lives and interact with a whole bunch of different organizations, right? So all of this this discipline of digital marketing of kind of search engine optimization, trying to to get people talking about your company on any kind of social media, all that stuff, that grew up kind of at the same time as the services themselves were coming about, right? So, uh, I mean, to, 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 to have been there, in a sense, from the beginning, and of course, neither of us is particularly old, so it's all a new, uh, a new business in, in the sense compared to, I don't know, automobiles or, or something else. To have been there and watch it evolve, I imagine things have changed substantially in how you operate digital marketing, how you do content creation, what what matters, what's impactful, all those things. Can you talk to me a little bit about what's changed since you got in the business and 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 how, I mean, the trials, tribulations, what, what went on going through this business? Yeah, so, I mean, just to kind of get a story complete, so I then, you know, you were the, you were the hen party company, the, the largest downspace hen party company in the UK. It was acquired later on. Um, then I started a new company in the back of my experience working with a Spanish company, uh, and it was basically content marketing because I helped the company, Spanish company, grow from seven odd million to forty five million revenue. The back of great content and, and SEO. Mm-hmm. So, and and then I started Good Milanton, which is my current company. It's been around for eight and a half nine years. But I think we are in a fascinating time to run a company to be in marketing because things are changing so rapidly that it's just like i think it's like that kind of that you know that very popular business kind of growth curve you see that in the exponential curve which you see and we are on that sort of the hockey stick the 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 curvy bit on the hockey stick um because things are changing all the time so when i got into uh marketing for the very first time it was all about social media like that was the buzzword social media social media social media over the time when I was running this stuff, it, it was became basically became about this whole SEO, which then became inbound marketing, then became funnel marketing, and you know all these new terms. And now we are in that space of AI, and what AI will do for us, and wh- how do we then react to all these different things? So marketing is evolving so quickly uh, because people know the impact it has on the bottom line and the top line. Um, it can really change businesses and the fundamental impact it has on the company and its team members is what makes it so interesting for companies because this one area of business can change the potential future of the company more than sometimes products can. So, mm-hmm. you know, an average product marketed really well can sell far more and bring in more revenue than a great product which is marketed really in a really bad way. And that's why it's so important. Uh, why some marketing is so important, in, in, in my opinion. And um, we are seeing, I mean, I can't even, like, I did AI, at, at the research in, in AI for many years, but I can't even predict what you're gonna, is going to happen in the future because it's going to be so different from what we know. Mm-hmm. Um, but the fundamentals will, will remain the same because marketing has been around for 
donkeys of years. It was not called marketing back then. But did we know? I mean, we, we probably, probably did. Like Napoleon used to write press releases for gazettes to get more money for his war campaigns. So even back then, his marketing as well was we just called something else, you know. So it's, it's the concepts have been there for many years. It's just rebranding new platforms and new niches, but the same fundamentals. So I mean, talk to me what. For, for those, since there's so many different ways of looking at marketing and what it is and, and how it functions, how do you see it today in your business? Kind of define it for the audience a little bit. What is content marketing as you see it? So content marketing for us and for a lot of our customers is a way to showcase two things or do two things. One is to showcase thought leadership, really helping companies to be the company or the organization in the industry, sure. having a voice, that's one. Number two is visibility. How do you get more eyeballs, more clicks uh, to showcase the ability a, a company's product or service has? Mm -hmm. So how can we do that? And that, you know, these are two main benefits of content marketing. As I see, if I just extrapolate the whole idea on a helicopter view, I would say it's all about really seeing these two benefits. Now, it has multiple forms. Um, marketing can be the form of like, you know, as you mentioned earlier, SEO, could be, you know, white papers to educate people, could right. be video production, to like talk about animated versions of it. Well, it's however you're cool. telling the story. I mean, you're, that's what you're ultimately doing, I imagine. That's what, what I'm doing in my business every day in, in the film business is I'm focusing on story. And I think that's the compelling thing for a lot of people is what, what, what is the story? What's the, what's, the, what's the meat of this business? What, what are they about? What do they do? What's the, how are they doing it? Why are they different? All those things. That's the story. That's the, the way that you get it out there. Right. I mean, there's so many different parts to it and how you do it. But ultimately, you're telling the story, right? Yeah. So the, the medium is storytelling. And why is that? The reason why storytelling is important is because if you, if, you, if you just like read history books and you just look at people, people engage with stories like we as social, social beings. And storytelling is the fundamental way we connect with other, other people. Um, you know, if you, if you just imagine, you know, the cavemen potentially spoke, you know, told stories around, around the fireplace and, and talked about, like, you know, this is what happened. I was chased by this animal and I managed to kind of care for our, 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 our dinner tonight, or whatever it might be. So, I mean, storytelling is the fundamental way, the medium we use. So anything we create ever for our customers or customers great for themselves, is just a narrative which kind of goes through. To write and to write great stories or to write great content or to create great content, there needs to be some core values incorporated into this thing, a, a core theme, uh, certain style guides prepared, for example, so that every story we tell is authentic to the company itself, as well as it is uh, impactful and powerful and and cohesive mm -hmm. um, because you don't want to tell different stories you know you can't you can't be aggressive in one polite in the other one you know, have to be consistent across so you know building that kind of knowledge base or a, a a content style guide is super important to make sure we're telling good consistent stories every time why aren't companies getting what they need to get uh to to tell their message effectively and, and properly market what's what's missing yeah it's uh, it's actually a, a really interesting challenge i often think about it you know and when, when i say if you go to you know a, a a a restaurant and we 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 love the food we're like oh i can cook i can cook that kind of meal i can make that make a lovely steak myself and i can start my own restaurant let me just start a new restaurant and serve this lovely steak because i can do it and everyone thinks it's super easy to do that you know all you have to do is just buy some steak from the, on, on the supermarket and just cook it and just present it then they forget all the stuff that goes behind to make the most yeah. perfect service, the best offering, the best experience in, in the restaurant. And I think this is the talent we have potentially in content as well. It looks really easy to do. You know, uh, many people feel that, you know, I, I, I love to write, I love to read. Uh, I understand the subject matter. Well, I can put it together. Um, 
that was one thing which is which has been happening for many years then, then comes ai now we are like that mindset on steroids right i i mean i i i want to talk about ai because i'm sure i i started to talk a little bit earlier about how things must have changed as as things have have gone on but Generative AI has been in the news, obviously, I don't know, the last couple of months since since OpenAI debuted ChatGPT and everything went crazy. So everybody's been talking about it. It's going to be transformative in a way. I, I in a, Now, I, I have my own opinions about it because I work in the movie business on a day-to-day basis, and we're in the midst of a Writers Guild strike here in the U.S. because of some disagreements about how AI is going to play a role in the business and all that. But it's going to be it's going to be something that changes, whether it's going to be as big as people forecast it to be, whether it's going to put everybody out of a job or be more of a tool that assists people remains to be seen. But how do you how do you see AI changing the business in the near term? I mean, how are you, I'm sure you're already incorporating some of it into your work and, and having to by request, I'm sure from clients and things. How is it, how is it changing your workflow? How do you see in the near term things altering with, with AI on the forefront? Yeah. It's, it's like, you know, when the first time I saw Air Jordans come into school and I'm like <laughs> lovely shoes, I want to get some of these. Like everybody's just going crazy about these new shoes come to the market. Everybody wants to buy it. And then suddenly after maybe maybe a year or so, it's not the same level of like need as we might have in the first day. I think, you know, AI is very powerful. Obviously it's powerful, but Talking from my own experience working in AI, I think there is there are pros and cons of using AI. The pro the pros are that it's great at research, can really figure something out, can bring stuff in from different areas. But imagine the world where every content looks exactly the same. Yes, because it's done by the same sort of LLM, which is large language model, maybe a different language model, but it has a small spin on it. But it's exactly the same. We'll never have real creative inputs because that needs real human beings. And again, you know, AI is going through a transformation as well, and it will take a bit of a time before it reaches AGI, which is, you know, uh, artificial general intelligence where people are scared about this and this, you know, take over the world and stuff like that. But it, it's basically remixing a lot of different things. It's not yes. creating brand new stuff. So the way I see AI is, that it's great for the initial first step to build templates to kind of do the initial research part. But that most important connection part, the storytelling part, the creative part, requires real human beings. Yes. That's not going to be changed. Yeah. And people feel that it's going to be changed and, you know, good. Well, think about that in that way. But my, based on my research and discussions and, you know, really being the subject matter for, for many years, I feel that it will be many years before that happens. There's, there's a change completely. We still need human beings. In fact, if you look at our website, we say content by humans for humans. And imagine an AI guy talking about this, you know, right. AI researcher talking about by humans for humans, because I believe that that is a fundamental requirement building great content. Yes, yes, yes. And I, I mean, I can't agree more with that. I think the the way that we look at at content and how it's created and what what anything that's generated right there there are areas where i think ai could really help us out uh including my stupid voice assistant that refuses to understand what i'm saying but the 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 fact is like you say it's a remix it's all just the same thing remixed it's it's only got access to what it's been fed that's why it's artificial and not you know full intelligence it's not forming, I mean, it is, in a sense, forming new connections between ideas, right? We have no way of explaining how how certain AI systems or machine learning algorithms have necessarily done what they did, why they did it. We To back that stuff out would, would, would be, in some ways, virtually impossible. I think, like, the YouTube algorithm does not operate in ways that the humans who originally programmed it always understand, but it, 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 it makes decisions like that, but it's only working on the information that's fed into it. 
And if you if you just keep remixing it, like you said, everything's just going to look the same. I see it personally as a tool for starting off, like you say, like do the research, give me feed me the 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 the, the bits I need to know, and cut out the 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 searching for for these bits of information because that's been done. That the tool did it. And if it's something simple, like it, it doesn't take a genius to write out, I don't know, the weather report for the day. You just summarize it and and use this information. They all kind of look the same. Today, it's going to be partly cloudy with a chance of stormy weather in the afternoon or around this time, all those things. Doing something that's, that's kind of a rote task and they're all going to look the same and you want to just start with something and then add your flair to it. I think that's great, a, a, a wonderful starting point. But beyond that, I still, like you, see the, see the need for, for humans to be engaging because that's how you're going to actually connect with people and draw, draw, those, draw those connections together. Yes, yes, yes. So I, I want to talk a little bit about your ideal clients and, and, and what industries you have as a sweet spot. But I also want to talk about and, and not let it slip to, to talk about operating your business in in uh, a more uh, compassionate way, one that that champions gender equality, things like that. That's been a, a something that's on the forefront of your company's kind of motto and mission is to champion gender equality. And I want to talk about why, why, why that's been so important to you, and and why, why now, why, why is that crucial in our company? Uh, we, we, our mission is to empower women in technology and marketing. Um, and so much of that, 80% plus women, uh, key members are women in our organization. And that's important to me because when I was studying um, science at school, uh, there were, I would say, almost half and half, half women, half men. I step into university and I, I see that you know it's just like maybe five percent women in engineering and 90 percent men and then when you go into the workplace technology is famously male dominated for example yeah. now i have a, a daughter who's you know two years now and getting pre in september and i i don't want her to to come into an economy which is unfair because a gender is you know, preferred or is their world. I feel like equality is a very important part. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, I feel like when we get, we get an opportunity to, you know, people who are marginalized a little bit, whether it's, whether it's women or minorities or anybody else, and let them shine. Actually, that really helps uh, the whole ecosystem. I mean, famously, obviously, the U.S. is a, uh, the home of of a lot of immigrants who come in and yeah. made the country what it is. I mean, it's 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 a fascinating story of what you know when you when you empower people what they can do and you know well stop top nation actually as it happens is people come together with the same mindset and say we will make a difference. The American dream is going to be a reality and we'll, we'll change the whole world. And that's that's been true for yeah. so many years, right? So yeah. I believe in empowering people because I think as a as a person, as an entrepreneur, as a father, like if I can do that, then I, my, my mission, my goal, my legacy is there. And that's that's really important to me. The whole company is built on the idea. We, we look to, to hire more women across the world, rather than flexibility, working opportunities from a remote environment to really empower them and their ability to generate wealth for their family. Yeah, I, that's fantastic. I mean, I, I, we should all have goals that lofty and try to, and I mean, say should, but I mean it. The, the, the fact is that we need to acknowledge and try and account for and, and correct imbalances when we see we could correct them, make somebody else's life better while making our own lives better in a sense, right? This is not bad for business to, to, to help somebody out or make it a priority to correct for an imbalance or, or a perceived injustice when you go, they're, they're, they're not getting a chance. There's not a way to, to make this happen. I can. These people are smart. They're driven. And they're the perfect fit for what you need, 
which is people who can operate in a remote environment and and give them freedom and flexibility to to do these things and and lift it up. Yes, yes, yes. And I think it's so often I, I you identified something that I've seen as well, which is a business that say is particularly male dominated. And because that's the way it is, people don't challenge the fact of whether that should be that way or not. Like, how did this happen? Why is it this way? What what goes on to, to make it this way? And why why are we ignoring a, a, a huge talent pool? Well, because that's just not the way it is. It's not the way it's been done. So what? Right? So what if it's been done that way? Let's 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 try it out. What's the worst that can happen? We go, oh, okay, it's the same. It's not going to be worse. There's no chance it's going to be worse. It's going to either be the same or better. If it's the same, I haven't lost anything. If it's better, I gained a lot, and so did they. That's 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 my kind of my kind of take on it. So, okay, at Goodman Lantern, what who's your ideal client? What's what industries are your sweet spot? What 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 do you feel like what the biggest hurdles are? How do you help clients over the the precipice there? The aim and the challenge we try to solve for our clients is to create great content. We are a content marketing agency. That's what our, 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 our position is. And our target customers really are high-tech companies. So mm-hmm. fintech, manufacturing automation, defense. What we're basically doing is we bring in subject matter, subject matter experts and making them work together with writers and editors who understand writing and editing. Right. And then the editor then has a team of like videographers, uh, designers, and everybody else you can pull in to kind of make sure they bring in the, the right kind of mindset. The idea really is to create great content requests thought leadership. It's hard for companies to find that in-house because all the thought leaders are busy creating new product, new services, selling, for example, that's where we come in to help them elevate their visibility and thought leadership so mm-hmm. that they can be seen more and they, they can be more opportunities for them to, 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 to grow faster and sell better. Yes, yes. And I think that the other side of it is if you're in it, if you're in the middle of it, if you're trying to create a great product, like you say, you don't have time to to, to focus on telling somebody else because I'm, I'm, what I'm doing I need to be over there doing more of it and and running down that road. And by the time I have a chance to pull over, so to speak, I can hire somebody who can do it a lot faster than I can to enable me to do something that's really productive with my time and and delegate that away. Yes, yes, yes. So Raj, we're coming kind of to the end here. I have so many questions I wanted to ask, but there's a couple that I like to ask everybody. And these can be broad, the entire world, or they can be very specific to your individual niche. What do you feel like the biggest fallacy is that everybody buys into, but at the end of the day is just total BS? What's what's way overrated? The one thing I can I can think of right now is the idea within companies that well I can do everything myself. Like I I'm the machine. I can get everything done myself. And the key to growth is delegation and elevation. So the more we can delegate and elevate people, the more we can actually grow. So the, I think the fallacy for me is, well, I'm a one-man band, I can do everything, everything on my own. Yep. Uh, I'm the one one manager, I can do everything on, on my own. I don't need anybody else. You know, I don't need anybody else's help. Huh? The reality is no, exactly, but delegation is super important. Yeah. So on the other side of that, what's underrated? What are, what are people overlooking? feel one thing that is underrated is education i think uh, you know we are taught that well school and then college or university and then that's it you know i'm, I'm done but actually continuous education is so important for the growth of um of an individual is if you're not constantly learning we basically are dead uh and i think um yeah, i feel like it's really important to invest in course in education. And in my opinion, I learn better with talking to other people. So, you know, how can I build a way to talk to smart people? So if, a, if, a, if I'm a billionaire, I'll become a billionaire at the end of it. That's what, that's my mindset. And I can learn a lot from them. So I'm just, I just, my, my mindset is to surround myself with smart people all the time. So I'm always learning from them. I think you who don't do that, maybe miss it quick potentially to grow their themselves, the businesses or whatever else might be. 
Yeah, yeah, I absolutely can. Yes, and that. Yes, yes, yes. Because the for me, when when I see people who who people I don't really want to talk to, it's people who've lost the sense of intellectual curiosity. That that just that that desire to learn or be fascinated by something new or different or or anything or explore a topic further. That that you go, I'm, you know what? I don't want to learn anything else because I know some people who are like that. To stay up on these things, I mean, whether it's AI or or marketing or, or learning how something new works or, or how the universe is put together or what's on the horizon, uh, that that's just, this, this stuff's cool. And I, I can't imagine not wanting to continue uh, adding arrows to your quiver, so to speak. Raj, thank you so much for joining me, folks. If you want to know more about Raj, you can check out goodmanlantern.com, follow him on Twitter and connect with him on LinkedIn. Links to everything are in the show notes as always. And until next time, I'm Andrew Wallace, and we don't have a problem. We've got an opportunity.